Uh, Paul, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'd like to thank the Alliance for the invitation to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I love the excuse to get down. I took the train down from Belfast this morning, and I'm going to jump back on it later this afternoon. And uh, so thanks again. It's, it's, it's great to do this. Um, I, I, where to start? You know, I, I was playing with all sorts of entry points on the very obscure title that Tanya gave me. Uh, I even rang her for a bit of help, and she wasn't any use at all. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, 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 and then I thought, I better, you better start maybe with some basics. Not because you don't know them, but just to bring us all onto a common place. Uh, and the first basic is that there's an awful lot of rubbish talked about human rights. Okay? An awful lot of rubbish. Uh, and it doesn't get much better. Uh, and it's just the only changes in the rubbish are that uh, the varieties and the form of it. Uh, whether it be, um, and it's not so different whether it be here or it be in the United Kingdom, be in the North or be in the South. Um, an awful lot of myths and um, strange misapprehensions and mischievous ideas and weird agendas uh, around human rights. Uh, and now, the fact that you're all united here uh, in an organization with the word rights in the title suggests to me that uh, you don't share a lot of that mythology. And that's obviously uh, a critical beginning. And it's a beginning that has to do with the fact that human rights are so damned important. Um, the world is a heck of a lot better than it was 100 years ago, 70, 60 years ago. Uh, and one dimension of why it's so dramatically and irrevocably better is because of the way we took a whole, uh, the whole gamut of human needs uh, and built a system of protections around them in the form of the International Human Rights Treaty System. It's a remarkable achievement uh, and it's one which we should not only applaud but we should uh, acknowledge the role of our own politicians uh, in crafting. Um, our Irish diplomats, uh, with their political leaders I suppose, uh, since the late 1940s have played a massive role in shaping uh, this international human rights protection system that's so valuable on the one hand and about which such nonsense is spoken on the other. Um, within the framework of this achievement, uh, we have uh, sort of like the jewel in the crown. If you live in the north at the moment, there's a lot of talk about crowns and uh, scepters and uh, such forth. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that most of them have a glorious diamond in the middle. Uh, and uh, if I were to identify the diamond in the middle of the human rights system, it's the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, uh, uh, time prevents us uh, from any great detail on what's in the treaty today, uh, fortunately for those who know, know it much better than I do, uh, but just suffice to make a few observations before moving on about what is an astonishing uh, piece of um, human rights protection, uh, a, 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 a legislative tool uh, to, 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 to take care of kids. Uh, in the first place, it sets a common standard uh, of childhood and for children around the world. A unifying step, uh, steps, a un unifying set of the minimum bits of safety net uh, to protect children wherever they may be, be they be, be they in Dublin, be they be in Durban or anywhere else uh, on earth. And uh, the second thing is that that a second remarkable feature is that you can talk about kids anywhere on earth because. Almost every country in the world, as most of you know, has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Famously, the United States uh, hasn't, uh, nor as of yet at least has Somalia, though Somalia since uh, recently has signed. So there's only one country left on earth that hasn't yet signed the treaty, and that's the United States. Even the Holy See has, has, has committed itself to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it's, it's this extraordinary unifying statement of values and of human rights uh, that bonds and affects and relates to almost every child on earth, except the unfortunate one that lives between Canada and Mexico. Um, now, another dimension of why the treaty matters so much is that it deals with the whole person. Uh, one of the difficulties with human rights is that it deals with bits of your life. We have treaties that look after your civil rights, treaties that look after your economic and social rights, with your protection against gender discrimination or racist discrimination, as if somehow you can cut up our lives into all these different chunks and dimensions. Uh, and we don't live our lives like that. I don't have my civil life uh, from nine to four, and then my ex socioeconomic right from four to seven, and maybe my cultural rights then in the evening. We don't live like that. Our whole experience of living our lives is an interplay of all these uh, needs and requirements we have, which are reflected in the whole gamut of human rights, civil, political, economic, social, cultural, you name it. And the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, was the first ever treaty that got that. Uh, and that actually 
wrote down the protections and the standards and they the identified, defined the safety net for kids, uh, reflecting on and acknowledging just the way people live, and in this case, the way a kid lives. A kid needs the socioeconomic protections side by side with civil and political and, and vice versa, and one has very little meaning without the other. And then the final dimension, and it really is the final of the content that I'll talk about, uh, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child that's worth mentioning to a group of experts on children here, because at least you'll get this straight away, uh, is the very effective way, it's not perfect, but the very effective way in which this treaty acknowledges the complexity of childhood. Um, on the one hand, the need to protect the child, but on the other, the need to empower the child. And you can see how those two necessary elements of engaging with kids um, are in tension with each other. Because the more you protect, there's a risk that the less you empower. And the more you, you, can, or you can do so much empowerment that you overlook creating the protective space. So getting that balance is something you know much more about than me, but you get the point. And that's the final remarkable dimension of this treaty uh, that I wanted to flag. Now why? Why does it matter to us? Well, I said it affects and protects. Uh, it's a protective framework for most kids in the world. And of course, uh, it, our primary interest today is in the fact that it's a protective framework for Irish children. Uh, Ireland has been a party to the treaty uh, almost from the outset. And this means that as a matter of law, as a matter of law, every single thing that's in the Con Convention of the Rights of the Child applies for the benefit of every Irish child. Um, even if we can't use the CRC easily in the courtroom, even if we can't invoke it as binding within the domestic national legal system, it is binding on Ireland internationally. And so we can use it with the same authority, the same vigor, with the same assurance as a law, as a set of legal requirements, uh, as we would any domestic statute, any provision of Bunroth's Nehera. And again, we have to get over our timidity in using these treaties. They're not supplementary, additional, maybe persuasive documents. They're binding obligations on the state, regardless of who's in power. And I think we need to be more forceful in reminding everybody of that fact. Now, how we use the treaty in our advocacy, albeit a legal basis for advocacy, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a big issue. There's a wide range of possible ways the treaty and other treaties can be used by organizations such as yours as advocacy tools. But what I did work out from my title today is that I'm only meant to speak about one of them. Uh, and so I'm going to put aside a whole range of really interesting things you can do with the CRC, and I'm going to focus just on how you might consider engaging with the way in which it's supervised internationally uh, with a view to getting benefit for the, the situation of kids that matter to you. And I realize with the extraordinary richness of the mix of people here, the organizations you represent, that you, re you represent a, a vast array of issues around uh, the rights of children. And uh, so we want to see how these international procedures can be used by you for them. Um, when I refer to international procedures, what I'm talking about here, and this is the really flat, boring bit, um, what I'm talking about is the fact that under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Ireland is obliged to submit a report periodically uh, on its record of implementing the Convention. It's meant to do a stock taking and in a very honest fashion uh, tell the international monitoring body uh, what's, what, the, what Ireland is achieving for kids in terms of the treaty and uh, where the gaps are. Uh, and um, uh, NGOs, and this is the bit I'll come back to, NGOs are invited to submit alternative, or sometimes they're called shadow reports, uh, to complement what the government is saying. Because every government on earth, with the best will in the world, will, um, will inflate the good news and conflate the bad news. Uh, and uh, even, even in a context where the government is not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes, you always need the counterbalance of the civil society voice in order for the international monitors to get the true picture of what's going on in Ireland. Um, the international monitoring body, by the way, again, I know, some of you know this, many of you do, forgive me, and this is what's known as the Committee on the Rights of the Child. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a body of people that meet a number of times a year in Geneva, uh, reviewing the, the record of states. And then at the end of that review, taking account of the NGO submissions, civil society inputs, they deliver a document with the gloriously bland title, but a, a document of great significance uh, called the Concluding Observations. I have a copy in the file. I won't dig it out because it'll just waste your time. 
But um, concluding observations are a remarkably detailed analysis of the situation of children in any given country, full of recommendations. Uh, and um, I, I'll come back again to what you can do with that document. But that's the output, ultimately, uh, of, of the review procedure. Um, where is Ireland? Well, Ireland was last reviewed uh, in substance across the main part of the treaty uh, in 2006. Um, it, it was reviewed, at, it, that was its second time round. Uh, so it has been due to deliver its um, next report, its third periodic report, uh, already now for a few years. Uh, it's late, uh, but my understanding is that uh, the report is being drafted and that we're likely to see it submitted reasonably soon. Um, there will then be a delay on the current practice of about two years, not good, uh, but this UN body is totally overloaded. <coughs> uh, there'll be a delay of about two years uh, until it will be reviewed in a session in Geneva. Um, that means that this is exactly the time that the Alliance and other groups need to be talking about how they're going to engage the process. There are a number of key moments you need to uh, keep a close eye out for uh, over the next while. Uh, the first is, to the extent there remains an ability to engage with the drafting of the report, and I simply don't know what ability there is, somebody will tell us, I'm sure. To the extent that there's still a window there, it should be seized. Not so that Ireland submits an integrated report, your views and the government view. That's considered bad practice internationally. We don't need a global report that sounds ha makes everybody happy. We do need the dialectic of the government voice, the civil society voice. Uh, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be speaking to each other. And so that is an important opportunity. And again, somebody here will tell us where we are on that. Uh, the second uh, dimension will be that um, it will be very important to get a, a good, strong set of submissions into the Committee on the Rights of the Child sometime within a few months of the report itself being submitted. Uh, that will be so that the Committee itself can figure out the issues that it's going to want to raise with Ireland, ultimately, when it comes to the hearings. And then there is, of course, the hearings themselves, where um, it's critically important that you turn up uh, and that you engage in a, in a really well-organized lobby uh, uh, with treaty body, with committee members. Uh, and those of you who've done it before will know, and those of you who have yet to do it will discover, that you can be extraordinarily influential if you do this game right. If you, if you do your submissions, smart submissions, you go and make the trip over, you speak to the right people, you'll be startled at the extent to which your views will ultimately be reflected in what the um, dialogue is with the Irish delegation and what will ultimately appear in the conclusions. Um, so why would, okay, in a way I've already started to answer the question of why would you do all of this? And I'm wrapping up with this in a couple of minutes. Um, why would you bother with all of this? Um, I, I jotted down just a few issues here of why it matters uh, to throw out to you. And by the way, this is based on experience, not just with regard to the human rights of children, but much more widely dealing with the similar bodies that deal with any number of other human rights uh, in the um, international system. Uh, well, the first is one I've spoken of just now, and that's the way in which you can actually in influence this international supervision process to agree that I don't think you believe if you haven't already done it. Um, secondly, you can already engage and trigger domestic advocacy impact just by engaging with the international process. You've seen yourselves, again, those of you not familiar with this stuff, other than in the media, how the moment that these types of reviews take place, there was a couple of years back around racism, for example, you will have seen how that <coughs> created really interesting and valuable media opportunities to get messages out there into the Irish public psyche. Uh, and again, it's this whole process uh, that opened up doors of that type. Uh, another related um, uh, win from engaging uh, has to do with the way in which it, um, it creates a space for you to dialogue with government with a level of intensity and attention and focus that isn't always there otherwise. Um, these are windows and moments when departments actually want to talk to you around issues. Uh, and where if, if something can be sorted out before everybody gets embarrassed in Geneva, things might just get sorted out. Now, they're the easy issues, I'm not naive. Uh, but on certain issues, it is actually doable. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, and uh, tracing myself back to the benefits I mentioned earlier, this whole process of engaging with the International Reporting Procedure and the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, allows you help sh shape uh, what could be considered to be a medium-term agenda for child rights in Ireland. 
uh, the concluding observations of the committee can serve exactly that purpose. Um, a, a detailed analysis and critique, together with remarkably focused recommendations, which with the authority, the imprimatur of a United Nations monitoring body, can become a reference point that you could use for a number of years after the whole procedure as a checklist in terms of uh, the state's duties to its children. Um, finally, or penultimately, uh, it, it does it really deliver for kids? I've given you all these kind of easy to measure and easy to spot benefits in terms of how you do your work. But ultimately, can we trace a knock-on impact for the welfare of a child and the empowerment of a child uh, 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 in relationship to all the effort you would want to put in this procedure? Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to answer that question scientifically, um, but it's increasingly easy to answer it anecdotally. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we still remarkably don't have enough studies, uh, good, solid, scientific, empirical studies that trace the uh, relationship between the review by the Committee on the Rights of the Child on the one hand and the social change on the other. That's partly because it's so darn difficult to do that kind of study. Because you might see the social change, but you'll point to a number of different factors which fed into it, only one of which might be the UN intervention. Uh, but, but that's why the science is, is, is not as much on the ground as you'd like. But I find in my own work, and I work around this type of supervision procedure a lot, and have done it now for decades, uh, and I sit on uh, an equivalent body to the Committee on the Rights of the Child that deals with civil and political rights, and I never cease to be amazed by the stories of success. Uh, the stories of um, a law that got changed because of the outrage generated around these proceedings, a policy that shifted because somebody finally noticed that this was just unacceptable, even a kid that got released out of jail, or, or a child that was put into foster care, uh, or, or, or another child that finally could access adoption uh, because uh, of, 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 of a fuss that was made in the United Nations context. And so it's uh, perhaps maybe not very compelling for you, but I would I'd, I'd go to my grave uh, uh, claiming that based on the anecdotal evidence, this procedure is not as strong as it'd like to be. It doesn't always succeed, but it's a heck of a lot uh, more influential uh, than it's sometimes given credit for. Uh, you can do the test yourselves, by the way, for Ireland, by looking at the conclusions that the committee adopted in September 2006. I read them again this morning, or I glanced through them this morning. It's a long document. 86 paragraphs of analysis and recommendations. Uh, that adds up to about 60 recommendations in total. Uh, so it's, it's, it's extraordinarily comprehensive. So have a look at it. Do your own survey before you engage in anything on the new report. Actually see what's happened with regard to the old report. Uh, and, um, and that would be, among other things, quite a useful indicator to you of whether it's all worth the effort, even though I would argue it is. And then finally, really finally, um, I know the Alliance is going to work on this issue, so I won't end up by saying if you work on it. I know you'll work on it. Uh, I know that Tanya would probably resign if you didn't work on it, uh, because she's been so instrumental in leading a process of this kind with regard to other treaties in her past lives. So I, I can't imagine that she'd not see this as the highest of priorities. So assuming the Alliance is going to move forward on this, my last word to you is, for goodness sake, stay allied. Stay allied. Stay together. Um, it's already remarkable the nature of your coalition. I read through the list today. It's astonishing. It's an astonishing list of organizations crossing all the spectrums of ideology, of political belief, of, of, of faith or non-faith basis. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most interesting coalitions on this island, uh, in the, the, this, this alliance. Uh, it gives you an extraordinary strength. Uh, and you, that strength will only be realized for you if you stay united in your submissions to the committee. Um, it's undoubtedly true and easily established and easy to prove that the more groups combine into coalitions to deliver their, their messages <coughs> to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, the more effective they are. And in states where there's a single voice going forward, then you really have an extraordinary club. Now, again there, that's not to suggest that everybody in this room or every organization in this room agrees on absolutely everything. Uh, you don't set out to be in such a situation. Uh, but at a minimum, I would have thought that there's a core submission that the Alliance could do to which every single one of your organizations could su subscribe. And then where there are uh, divergences around specialist issues, put in those separate submissions in parallel. 
This is an established procedure. It works well. Uh, and I suggest to you that it, it really is the way to succeed. So I'll leave it there. Again, for those of you who know this stuff, my apologies. Uh, but I, I was asked to speak on the assumption there were some people in the room for whom this was new territory. Uh, I'd be very happy to um, elaborate or uh, make it a little bit clearer anything in the form of Q&A.